What is up guys, Forrest here. Glad to see y'all tuning in today and I'm also glad that it's finally flannel season. It's a cool 62 degrees here in Virginia Beach today. And today we're going to be talking about six bad habits in programming. Now how do I know these are bad habits? Because I do them, or did them, or, or do them and try to correct them. In the preparation of this video, I noticed that everything I reference is in terms of Java. It's just what I do, it's what I'm best at, but I'm not sure how well that comes across with y'all. So if you would, Go down to the comment section and leave what is your primary programming language? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna comment down below, same exact question, what is your primary programming language? I'm gonna pin that comment, comment to the top of the comment section below, and I want you to reply to that comment with your primary programming language. Java, Python, C Sharp, C++, Swift. Let me know in the comment section below because I'm genuinely curious as what our community is primarily programming in. And while you're down there, you pass the like button, you know, that big old thumbs up button. You also pass the subscribe button so if you're new here you like the video consider hitting both of those all right bad habit number one is finding a solution and moving on before actually trying to implement that solution you run into a problem it may spit out an error at you or you're trying to describe your problem in in the internet Google DuckDuckGo whatever search engine you use and you get a list of results you see all right that one's not exactly the same oh, this one looks similar Let me click on that you click on that you go in and you look at the problem and you look at the solution, you're like, ah, that's not exactly my problem. And so you decide to move on to the next one and then move on to the next one. And then keep in search of finding a problem and solution match on the internet that is the same exact as your particular scenario. Or maybe you do find your exact problem and you look at the solution, it's a code snippet, so you copy that code snippet, you paste it into your code and it doesn't work, so you move on to the next potential problem and solution. That's where you go wrong because you're just trying to not figure out the problem, but just try to make the problem go away. You're not trying to solve the problem. What you really wanna do is figure out why. Why am I facing this error or bug and how do I actually go about fixing it? And when you Google what you were Googling or searching the internet, because I know a lot of people don't like Google, then what you will find is the problem that's similar to yours, maybe the same exact, the solution may not be the same exact as what you need, but you understand why that solution is the solution for that problem, why it has 200 upvotes, why it is the ex accepted answer for that problem with Stack Overflow, you need to understand that because that'll allow you to understand the problem at hand and help you solve your problem instead of just trying to make your problem disappear. I mean, that's how it worked back in the tutorial days, right? You would have a particular tutorial, a problem and solution that people have done thousands of times before, so you do have the exact problem and the exact solution because you're working on the same code as this particular person because it's a tutorial. Someone has done the tutorial before you, you go to their code, you find the solution that you're looking for your problem, you copy, you control C, control V. You control C, you control V. You just keep doing that until you have no more problems. But that's not how it is in the real world because you're working with a proprietary code base or you have a unique problem where you need your own particular solution because when it comes to the real world, not all the code is the same. Tutorials, it's basically the same. But all the code and all this different, it's, it's different. Bad habit number two is not documenting your code because you think you'll remember it. Now, who is guilty of this? All right, I may be guilty of this. I just, I just wanna do it. Documenting all of this code makes this particular task last a whole lot longer. I can figure this out. It's fairly straightforward. The logic seems to make sense. I'm using good class names, method names, variable names. All of it should make sense within the code. Or maybe it's because I just did it is why everything makes sense. Six months down the line, one year down the line, when I have to revisit this code for one reason or another, it may be a different story. Really, all I have to do is shift alt J. I don't like the auto-generated Java docs in terms of what they lay out, so what I do is I use it as a template. I make a few minor adjustments. I have my parameters in there. I have my return in there. And that way, you can explain what your public methods are being used for. And when you're somewhere else in the code using that particular method, you can just hover over the method name where it's being used, and you can see the parameters, the returns, whatever other information you add in there. This is also where it gets tricky because you have one side of the spectrum that says, hey, we should have comments everywhere. The more comments, the better. Then you have the other side of the spectrum that says, if you comment up your code, that means the logic is flawed. You should be able to read the code and understand what the code says. First off, do what works best for you and your team. 
if your team isn't doing it right, then maybe you need to talk with them so you can figure out what is best for you and your team. Me, I do it on a case by case basis, but I never use comments like return the value divided by two. Like that's just, that's dumb, that's redundant. I don't see those to be particularly helpful. 99% of the time the code is fairly straightforward and what could be a bad habit in and of itself is over commenting. Little comments like that, they're just, they're just unnecessary. Now, if we go on the flip side to where they are necessary, every public method within an, an API class, that should have Java docs. Some sort of documentation to explain what that is, that way when you're using it elsewhere, as mentioned previously, you're able to just hover over and you can see the parameters, returns, whatever other information you put in there, what the method actually does, and that'll make your life a whole lot easier. Now, there's also this whole other side of documentation that involves basically the documentation that you read when you're learning a programming language, or basically the equivalent of a readme file. Now, I don't really care to go over all that in this video, Frankly, I don't care to go over that in any video, but if y'all wanna see more about that side of the documentation, then just let me know down in the comment section below. Let me know, also vote in the poll if you wanna see it or if you don't, because if I don't get an overwhelming amount of, of feedback saying yes, I want you to make video about traditional documentation, I'm not gonna make it just because it's, it doesn't seem that interesting. But if there's an overwhelming amount of people who wanna see it, like I said, a bunch of votes up in the poll that say yes, a bunch of comments down in the, in the comment section that say yes, then just maybe I'll make that in the future. Bad habit number three is just using your ID instead of mastering it. Now, for example, let's take a look at this desk. This desk, it's a nice desk. I can sit right here. I can do whatever work I need to get done. Same with this desk right here. But sometimes my back hurts. I need to get on my feet, you know, kind of get the blood flowing through instead of just sitting all day. So I can take this box over here. I can stack that up. I can take that box over there, stack that on top of there to the point where I'm finally standing up and I'm using this desk with a stack of books and boxes as a standing desk. Or I can just go right here, I can hit this button, and it can go up, and it can go down. That way is a whole lot easier and better, more sturdy. Your IDE, it has a bunch of shortcuts and tools and features that will only speed up your development time, but that will make your code better. Learn your IDE just as you're learning your programming principles, your syntax, your software engineering principles, it's important. Today's sponsor is Skillshare, and as I know, many of y'all are interested in web development and in spirit of IDEs and text editors. What I've done is I found this course on Skillshare called VS Code Beginner. It is a one hour course by the teacher, Alan Simpson. It goes over nine lessons, a few of which are getting around VS Code, folder and file basics for VS Code, writing and editing code in VS Code, talking a bit more about extensions and a lot more fun stuff within this course. Visual Studio Code is incredibly popular in the web development industry. That's what I use for my front end work for my web application. But if that's not your thing, or maybe you want to learn something else, Skillshare has over 23,000 classes for anything from animation, web development, UI UX design, or freelancing. All of which you can take right now by using the link in the top of the description to receive two months of Skillshare Premium for free. And as you see here, this is just one of the many, many courses that they have and is only one hour and two minutes long. So there's not a doubt in my mind that you can get through multiple courses in that two month free trial. Bad habit number four is not building your code before you push. <laughs> oh, this is a bad one. It's so obvious that it is often overlooked. You're building a web app with code on one monitor and the app on the other. You realize you need to make a list on this particular screen right here, so you're messing with your code, a little bit of UI work, and things are looking swell. The list is popping up, it's showing what it needs to show. You're like, okay, that's good. Let me uh, save this, I'm gonna commit it, push it on up so, so Jerry over there can get to his task because he needs this list in order to work on his task. Except Jerry finds a problem. The code won't build, but it worked on my computer, as they always say. But did you actually try to build it before you pushed it? Did you do a fresh build after you made those changes, or did you just see that the UI changed the way you wanted it to and said, okay, we're good, let's push it? That'll get you. Even if you're just making the smallest of changes, it is good to do a fresh build before you commit and push, especially, especially if you were leaving for the day or the weekend, because the worst thing is you pushing your code up to the development repository and someone else pulling down that code to make sure that their local repository is up to date and they realize that it builds and you're not there, they give you a call, Jerry's over here, he's upset, he gives you a call, hey, your code's broken and you're sitting at home about to have dinner with your wife and kids or whatever it may be, 
what are you going to do then? You're just going to say, ah, I'll get to it tomorrow. Or are you going to interrupt your dinner and you're going to, you're going to fix that code right there on the spot and make sure it works properly. I mean, sure, Jerry over there could, could revert from that commit. So he's back on his own code base, but that's, it, you see where this gets a little bit sticky. He shouldn't have to do that because the code that's committed up into the repository should be good should be able to build so we can build on top of it. Just build before you push. It'll save you and your team a big headache. Bad habit number five, being immature during code reviews. Now, this is my best way of putting it because it can go on either side of the spectrum for the people who are doing the code reviews to the people who are receiving the code reviews, getting their code reviewed. For those that are doing code reviews, there are good ways to say things and there are bad ways to say things. The bad way to say things is in terms of bashing, belittling, like this person worked hard on this code. Even if it's not exactly how you would do it or if there's a lot better way that you know, this person may not. This is a little bit of a learning experience. This is how they thought that was the best solution to solve this problem. So what you need to do is constructive criticism. And it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So say it in a way that you are trying to help them, not that you are trying to bash their code or bash them. That is a mindset you need to have because you're trying to help this person. You're not trying to bash their code. You want them to be able to learn from this experience so it doesn't happen again in the future. Show them a better way of solving this solution. Give them a little bit of pointers without being a complete you know what I mean. It's not what you say, it's how you say it, so say it right. And on the flip side, if you're on the receiving end, Take it as constructive criticism. Take it as they're trying to help you. Don't get upset. Don't get defensive. Take what they say and learn from it. Ask them about it. If you disagree, explain to them why you disagree. One of two things will happen. Either they will learn something because you say, okay, I did the code this way and that is why I didn't do it the way you suggested because I think this way is better and they'll say, okay. Or they will come back and say, well, I think this way is better because X, Y, and Z and then you will learn something. Communication in this is key. Either you will learn something or I will learn something. Those are the five bad habits that I do that I'm sure many other people do as well. If there are any other bad habits that you have, leave those down in the comment section below. It'll just be a fun little, fun little mess of bad habits down there. A little secret. For those y'all who made it this far in the video, y'all are the good developers. Why do I say y'all are good developers? Not just because you're watching this video, but because you took the time to actually understand why these are bad habits. A lot of people just scroll down to the comment, se comment section, look for a comment where it has these five bad habits listed out, bulleted out in a comment, and they say, okay, thank goodness. I didn't have to watch this 12 minute video or whatever it may be. I got these five bad habits. Okay, well, what is a list of five bad habits gonna to do to you? Like, it's not gonna help you. Not if you don't understand why they're bad habits. You watching this video all the way through shows that you actually want to learn, that you actually want to understand. In regards to our first bad habit, y'all are gonna be the people who actually look into understanding the solution instead of just trying to make this problem go away. Y'all are the ones that are gonna be good developers one day. So if you're watching this right now, comment down below like, hashtag good dev squad. How about that? Hashtag good dev squad. And while you're down there, if you didn't already hit the like button, if you're not already subscribed, be sure to do that. And I'll see y'all next week.